You can go to time, we can start now. Okay, here we go. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our com online conference today. Before giving the floor to our dear guest, I want to introduce our team. I will be the moderator of today's conference. My name is Güngör Usta. I am graduated from the Neurosurgery Department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital in 9, 2009. These online education meetings have started with Professor Hasan Kamil Sucu, the program manager of the Neurosurgery Department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital and goes on with the contributions of all residents. Also, with the contributions of neurosurgeons who graduated from the same department. I kindly ask you to keep your microphones turned off during the presentation of the lecturer to avoid voice and noise pollution. You can ask your questions by writing to the chat part uh, of the Zoom program. At the end of this presentation, your questions will be asked to the lecturer and will be discussed. Mutual discussion is not proper for our format uh, and meeting. Please do not ask your microphone to be turned on. And now I will uh, I have a great pleasure to introduce our guest, Associate Professor Jacob Bodilsen. Dr. Bodilsen was graduated from Aarhus University in 2008. He got a PhD degree from Halborg University on epidemiology of brain abscess, studies on incidence, risk factors, and prognosis. He is the editorial member of the Euro European Journal of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases since April 2021. He has clinical trials on partial oral antibiotics treatment for bacterial brain abscess, a cyclovir for HSV2 meningitis, the impact of camostat metacillate on COVID-19 infection, azithromycin versus placebo for the clinical outcome in Campylobacter concissus diarrhea. Dr. Bodilson has 60 publications and he is the first author of 29, including JAMA, BMJ, Clinical Infectious Diseases and Neurology, as well as an editorial in Lancet Infectious Diseases. He is a member of several scientific study groups on infectious diseases. He had some educational and administrative positions in different dates in Alborg University. Yes, uh, yes uh, sir, welcome again to our online uh, conference. We are listening to you. Uh, the microphone is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Gungur. That was a very nice presentation and apologies for all the recitals of different merits, but that was very kind of you, so thank you. And I'll start sharing my screen here. And it worked just a second ago, so I hope it'll work also now. Do you see my screen, Gunga? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. And I'll just see if I can hide you guys. So I can't see anybody, uh, just to let you know. So as uh, Gunga said, write your questions in the chat or Gungur or Hassan can interrupt me and we can have some discussion or we keep it in the end. We, we will uh, make it in that. Right, right. Good. Okay. Perfect. So let me start off by saying it's a really great honor to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. And because brain abscess is, uh, is quite a neurosurgical disease and I'm an ID specialist, so I'm kind of playing the, the outfield today, but I hope you'll Bear with me. I have perhaps some perspectives that are slightly different than yours and the other way around. And hopefully we can learn from each other and have a very nice conversation here today. But so I just wanted to thank you. So this is a, an image from an actual brain abscess patient sent to me by my friend uh, Matthias Brewer in Amsterdam. And I, and I really like it because it has that heart shaped brain abscess. Uh, I was just going to change the slide here. Uh, here, yeah. so you see the next slide, right? So it's just a disclaimer. Yes, yes. So right now we're doing uh, the first international guideline on brain abscess on behalf of the European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. So I'm the chair of that, and we're planning on publishing in 
September 2023. So it's an ongoing project. Actually, August Sipahi from uh, uh, Izmir is is uh, is on that guideline board. So say hi to him if you see him. Otherwise, I think I'll just move on. So today we'll talk about the background, the epidemiology, clinical presentation, diagnostics, treatment, and complications of brain abscess. So I'll start off with uh, this case because I think it kind of uh, shows off what we are usually dealing with. This was a 54 year old healthy male. He was admitted with first time spontaneous seizures. And then we saw this scan and then we questioned him a bit more and he admitted to having had slight visual impairment. So what did we do? Of course, there was an aspiration, five milliliters of pus, and it turned out to be oral cavity bacteria. And it was polymicrobial. This is quite common, I think, in most places. And um, started him on antibiotics. And uh, on day eight, you can see that this was the scan. And even though it's not the same image, exactly the same image, you get the impression that the brain abscess has increased in volume. But this was quite early on during his clinical course. So we were uh, reluctant to proceed with further neurosurgery for now. And it turned out to be a bit of a mistake. As you can see here by day 21, the abscess had increased even further and there was a second abscess and they, they were both aspirated. And after eight weeks of treatment, he, uh, the, the abscess uh, regressed and he would uh, he, he became well and didn't have any complications afterwards and no seizures. So that was kind of what I think is what is often going on today, at least in my setting. We have patients who come in uh, this time with seizures. Other times it's quite of a chance finding maybe they've had a headache for some time and then there's this diagnosis and there's one or two aspirations and then they survive and they do fine. Although sometimes they don't, but... But uh, luckily, this is mostly what is going on. But we'll get into some of the more severe cases later on. So just for the background, this was the graph that I constructed myself. It's not entirely accurate. It's just to give you a sense of the history in it. Uh, so on the left-hand y-axis, we have the instance. Then we have the, the time in years in, on the x-axis. On the right-hand y-axis, we have the mortality. And we, if we look at the instance, I think it's fair to say that the incidence was more frequent uh, about a hundred years ago because a lot of uh, patients got, uh, or individuals were a lot more likely to get injured in everyday life, uh, work-related injuries or violence, and then they'd have their secondary brain abscess. There were also more uh, congenital heart disease and chronic ear, nose, throat infections that would disseminate into the brain. But actually, of course, you can understand that the inst incidence estimates were quite vague and uh, poor quality uh, previously. Uh, but, but I think most estimates, so there was one from the Mayo Clinic anyways, that suggested an incidence about 1.3 per 100,000 in, uh, in the 1930s. Then came antibiotics in the 1950s, really in hospital care and the CT scan in the 70s. We ought to diagnose more brain abscesses with the, the advent of CT scan, but uh, still the instance decreased. I think it was because the socioeconomic uh, advances in general society and also less frequent chronic ear nose throat infections and less hazardous work-related injuries. Uh, then came the HIV epidemic and a lot of toxoplasmosis uh, was a com complication to that. And then the introduction of highly accurate uh, antiretroviral therapy in the 90s. And then there was a, a decrease again in the instance. So, so that was just an impression that you'd get from reading the studies uh, back through the last century. When we assess the mortality, well, if it's untreated, it, this is a lethal disease. Everybody dies. But as neurosurgeons know, if you evacuate the pus and some patients sometimes survive. And uh, especially if we combine neurosurgery with antibiotics, you can see here, then the mortality really started to decrease. And I think nowadays the case fatality rate is somewhere between five, eight or 10%, depending on your setting. However, previous studies have a lot of limitations. Uh, 
most because brain abscess is such a rare disease, uh, most studies are limited to retrospective single center accounts, mostly from uh, departments of neurosurgery, actually. So you're to be commended for that. That was very helpful for uh, outlining the clinical presentation and management of these patients. Uh, however, there are some limitations still. Uh, you often have to go through a very long study period to get an adequate sample size. So it also makes some, his some patient populations historic. For instance, before the introduction of CT scans or stereotactic MRI or modern antibiotics. So that makes it difficult to compare, I think, to uh, modern times. And then there's also often limited follow-up in patients. They get discharged and then they're lost to follow-up. So for the immediate course for patients treated at departments of neurosurgery, they're really helpful. I think they're, they're good value. But if you want to describe the entire disease, patients who are admitted and those who are not admitted to departments of neurosurgery, then you need to use other study designs to complement the other the first studies. So that was kind of the background uh, for previous studies. Uh, actually, I, I noticed that Turkey are quite active in this line of business. I, I found at least 20 original studies from Turkey in, in my library, which means that there ought to be uh, lots more out there. So you, I think you've had a kind of interest in this topic, which of course makes me happy. So let me just introduce you to the next studies that I'll show you because they're epidemiological. I can't help it, but show you some of the studies that we did. And in order to understand them, you need to learn a little bit about the Danish healthcare system. So we have kind of a surveillance society, meaning that every single person who is born in Denmark or immigrates into Denmark are assigned a unique a 10 digit number. So my number would be uh, my birth date, the first six digits. So that would be the 27th of March, 1980. And then the last four digits you can see here with SSS, one indicates which century you were born. This is relevant now after the millennium. And then there are these unique serial numbers. And then the last uh, number shows which sex you are. If, if it's an even number, you're female. And if it's uneven, you're male. So by this number, every single contact with Danish healthcare system, you use this number to identify yourself and all that is going on, all prescriptions, all treatments, all diagnoses are categorized and attached or assigned this, this uh, civil registration number. So uh, we know uh, every single healthcare contact that I've had in Denmark and everybody else who is a resident in Denmark. And the uh, second healthcare is free of charge in Denmark. We pay a lot of taxes and thereby we get the, the advantages of free school, but also free healthcare. So nobody pays for healthcare in Denmark. It's, it's free for everyone. And this makes the Danish healthcare system unique for doing these epidemiological studies that I'll show you in just a little bit. So for these studies, uh, I looked at the Danish registries from 1982 until uh, 2016. And during that time, the Danish population increased from 5.1 to 5.7 million people. So I think we're probably less than Istanbul. I think you're 80 million people in, in Turkey. So we're dwarfed by, by your country, but nevertheless, this is the entire country of Denmark. And it's a 35 year study period. So it leads totals into 186 uh, million years of uh, observation. So this was the Danish civil registration system that I told you about where I get that individual ID and that is used as the center or the core registry. And then we can link it on, in an individual level. For instance, if I had had a brain abscess, I'd be listed in the Danish national patient registry. We use that to obtain diagnosis codes of all healthcare contexts. And then we also looked into the medical records at one point to validate the diagnosis codes. And for some of the studies, I also did a local study here in Oldborg, but I won't uh, get into that right now. So using these registries, we looked at the incidence of brain abscess in Denmark during that 35 year period, as you can see here, we have the, on the x-axis the year and on the y-axis the incidence per 100,000 per year. And you can see 
that compared to previous estimates, which were about 0.3 to 0.4 per 100,000 per year, we actually found that if you also look at patients who were not admitted to the Department of Neurosurgery, the incidence was about 0.6 in Denmark back in 1982, an increase to about 0.9 in 2016. So we had an aging population in Denmark, but we took account of that in the statistical analysis. We adjusted for that. Uh, but I think the increase in incidence is likely due to an increased use of uh, imaging, both CT, but especially MRI availability became a uh, uh, quite increased during the early 2000s and also an increasing proportion of patients with immunocompromised patients surviving with cancer or being treated with biological treatments for rheumatoid arthritis or similar conditions. If we look into the age groups, again, as you can see here on the x-axis, we have year intervals and then we have the age groups here. These are the kids, the young adults, the middle-aged, the somewhat older adults and the very, very grown up adults here. And you can see the increase is, uh, is in the adults only. For kids and young adults, the incidence is stable or slightly decreasing. So risk factors for brain abscess. I think immunocompromise is becoming more and more important, at least in, in most Western settings with organ transplants and hematological malignancies. Uh, contiguous infections are still quite important, chronic ear, nose, throat infections, but also dental infections. Uh, I'll get a bit more into the dental infections in just a bit, because I think they're increasingly important. For bacterial meningitis, this is mostly for neonates who have, for, for instance, E. coli meningitis, and sometimes it may form secondary brain abscess. We've also seen a couple of cases of uh, pneumococcal meningitis and turning into a secondary brain abscess. Then there is uh, uh, previous neurosurgery. Patients who require neurosurgery are sometimes very, very ill, could be traffic victims or cancer. And then of course they're prone with every operation, there's a risk of infection. So it kind of makes sense. I think brain trauma is less frequent nowadays, more frequent in, in very uh, poor settings with the uh, uh, where the traffic infrastructure is, is somewhat uh, compromised. Then there's the risk of distant focus of infection and secondary seeding. Endocarditis is often mentioned and listed. I think it's infrequent as a risk factor for brain abscess or cause of brain abscess. Less than 5% of brain abscess patients have underlying endocarditis. And then there's uh, the one that used to be very frequent in children, the cyanotic congenital heart disease. At least in my setting, I think with the prenatal diagnostics, some pay, uh, fetuses are diagnosed with severe heart disease and uh, some uh, uh, pregnancies are terminated on behalf of that. And then there may also be the pulmonary arterial venous malformations, which is a somewhat rare cause of brain abscess. And still, I think you must also have seen these patients. Sometimes you get a 45-year-old male who is completely healthy, and you have no idea why this patient got a brain abscess. And that happens in about 20 or 30% of cases. There is no obvious reason for that patient to have had a brain abscess. And that, uh, at least to me, is, is quite interesting and something that I'm trying to look into. But I'm not sure that I will succeed, but I'll give it a go. So here we did a case control study on risk factors for brain abscess. I must apologize for the very busy table. It was hard not to, to include all the data. Uh, on, I'll, I'll take you through it. So here you have the, the relative risk. And if it's one, then there's no increased risk. If it's over here on the right-hand side, there's increased risk for that uh, risk factor for brain abscess. And over here, there's a decreased risk. And then we tested these different risk factors just based on previous literature and I guess common sense. And we had the 1,384 brain abscess patients and we matched each brain abs abscess patients individually with 10 in uh, control population uh, from the population, from the background population. And they were matched on a year of uh, birth and sex and uh, residence. Uh, and on the date of the brain abscess diagnosis. And uh, 
when we did that and examined, for instance, previous head trauma, you can see here there was an increased risk both in the unadjusted and in the adjusted uh, analysis. And what uh, becomes quite clear here is that, oh, sorry, that the importance of a risk factor is both dependent on the odds ratio. So you can see neurosurgery has a very high odds ratio, about 26 unadjusted and 20 if you adjust it also for it, the child's in comorbidity score. But uh, the importance on a societal level is also relies not only on the odds ratio, but also on the frequency of the underlying risk factor in the background population. So luckily neurosurgery is not required for a lot of Danish residents. And I don't think it's required in a lot of Turkish people. So it's a kind of an infrequent uh, procedure in society, whereas at least in my setting, diabetes is quite frequent. So even though the odds ratio is lower for diabetes, it may be more important because it's so frequent in the background population. And there's a way to combine these two expressions, and it's called the population attributable risk. And it represents a, some theoretical world where you would see if we if there was a world where there were no brain trauma or there was no diabetes, uh, how much would uh, the, the instance of brain abscess decrease in that fictive world that doesn't exist? But it's a kind of a way to combine the odds ratio with the frequency in the background population. So I think it's kind of nice just to combine those. So, so if you imagine a world without neurosurgery, of course, we couldn't imagine that, but just give it a go. We would have 12% fewer brain abscesses. So this is the population attributable risks here. So that was uh, still the most important risk factor for brain abscess. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do neurosurgery, it's just to, to show you. Uh, of course, there's an increased risk. But other important risk factors are also ENOS throat infections, where if there were no ENOS throat infections in, in Denmark, we'd have 9% fewer brain abscesses. So should the government aim to uh, just completely abolish you know, throat infection, that's not uh, feasible, but it's just still gets you a sense of the importance of each risk factor. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So I put in here some of the ones that were particularly eye-opening neurosurgery, you know, throat infections, head trauma, and then there was dental infection and congenital heart disease. Moving on to immunosuppression, I looked a bit more into that. So cancer is really, you can see here the population attributable risk in the far right column. It has an 11% attributable risk. And also immunomodulating treatments were uh, quite significant risk factors. Okay, moving on to the clinical presentation. Uh, so the median duration of symptoms before hospital admission is usually seven days, but there's a very wide range, as you can tell here in the parenthesis. And as I told you, and I think you can agree with me from your experience, at least I hope you share that experience that a lot of these patients are sort of incidental findings. They may have had a headache, they may have had fever or some combination of that. They may have had some vague or unclear neurological deficit. They get the MRI and then you see there's a brain abscess. And then there's the other group of patients where the brain abscess has ruptured and they come in, they're severely ill. When you ask their next of kin and their loved ones, they may have had a headache for a couple of days and then suddenly they, they lost their consciousness and they're, they're brought into the emergency room and they're just severely ill. They may be in opistotonus and, uh, and those patients are just really, really sick. Okay, so you can see here the clinical presentation is mostly somewhat vague. Few patients have the classic triad of headache, fever, and neurological deficit. It's only in 20% of patients. Only 60% have an increased CRP or leukocytosis. And then there's a, this, and I think there's a wide range to this uh, account of how many have the rupture of the brain abscess on admission. I don't think it's 35% in my setting, it's about 15 or 17% but it really depends on how you, how you examine your study population. Do you only include patients admitted at the Department of Neurosurgery or at one hospital or in all hospitals in your geographic region? It may 
it may affect such numbers. So I'll go briefly through this because I think you know it. You're all neurosurgeons. We use MRI or less often CT with the contrast. We should do the neurosurgical aspiration or excision, and often a chest X-ray or sometimes a CT is done to make sure there is no chest infection or maybely an, an arterial venous malformation. The blood cultures are only positive in about one out of four to one out of three. And then often we do uh, a search depending on which bacteria we find or if we don't find any, we often have uh, a, a look in, into the mouths and make sure there's no dental focus or near nose throat focus. Sometimes we do the echocardiography uh, and we should often do the HIV test, I think, because there's a very excellent treatment for that infection. So that's important and it's very cheap to do. So the lumbar puncture, I noticed that uh, Dr. Hassan Tuchu put it in the learning objective. So as, as I told you, and you can probably relate, some patients are brought to the emergency room, their abscess have ruptured, but you don't know that. You think they have bacterial meningitis and you do the lumbar puncture before you realize they have a brain abscess. Uh, so that's just everyday clinical reality. That's how it goes. And uh, CSF is culture positive in about 24% of those. So for the MRI, it's better than the CT and we should use the DWI and it'll be hyper intense and it'll be hypo intense on the ADC sequences. So the distribution of brain abscesses in this meta-analysis by Matthias in 2014 showed the distribution of frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital, and then the deep uh, brain stem or cerebellum. Uh, and it looks kind of similar I think in most studies around the world, there may be a slight distribution towards uh, frontal or temporal or cerebellar brain abscess if you have a lot of chronic ear nose throat infections in your setting. But otherwise, I think it's fairly similar in, uh, in most uh, countries. There's a single abscess in 82% of cases. And still, I think it's difficult to predict the mechanism by which the brain abscess was induced based solely on the anatomic distribution or location of the brain abscess. So if it's cerebellar, it's not necessarily an autogenic brain abscess. There may be other mechanisms involved. So I think you should do a pretty rigorous and standardized diagnostic workup of most patients. So looking into the microbiology, um, I included here the famous uh, meta-analysis by Matthias Brewer. He examined studies published from 1970 to 2013. This means that the study population actually goes all the way back to 1935 and until 2012 or 13. So it's quite a heterogeneous study population. As you know, brain abscess are, it's both bacteria and, and parasites and fungi and, and some unusual bacteria like mycobacteria. So and no cardiosis and so on. So, but still when we compare it we did this uh, medical record review of all patients admitted in Denmark in the 10 year period. And it's uh, often quite similar. So uh, we were getting better at identifying which pathogens were involved. This is both adults and children. Uh, and it's the same over here. And you can tell that the oral cavity bacteria are really the dominant uh, pathogen. In most settings, I think we're up to about 60% nowadays in, in my setting when we, we, we've we expanded that account here until 2021. Um, and then it's Staphylococcus aureus. It was more frequent previously. It's infrequent in my setting. We don't have a lot of complicated head trauma or neurosurgery performed in rudimentary settings. So, so I think the secondary brain abscesses are luckily getting uh, more infrequent, so Staph aureus is not frequent in our setting, whereas I don't know if you're familiar with the study from um, South Africa, where they had about 900 patients in the 90s, they had a lot of HIV and they really had a lot of brain trauma, so they had a lot of Staph aureus in that uh, study by Nathu and, and et al. Okay, and then there are all these opportunistic pathogens, which are also infrequent. But this also means that empiric antibiotics don't cover all pathogens, it, it has to be operational. We can't give all patients meropenem and vancomycin and sulfur, metoxazole combined with 
trimethoprim. So, it, so it, uh, most authors suggest a third generation cephalosporin combined with metronidazole. And it's good, but it doesn't cover all pathogens. So it's sometimes you stratify it depending on which risk factors the patient has. We'll get more into it later. It's just to show you that there's not a one size fits all. So we need help from the neurosurgeons uh, for many reasons, both to get the diagnosis and also to reduce the bacterial inoculum. That's very important in my opinion. Okay. Uh, so in the last 20 years, molecular diagnostics have really uh, improved. Uh, so for the oral cavity uh, brain abscesses, it's been very consistently shown that they're always polymicrobial. There are so many pathogens involved in, uh, in those infections. So for those infections, I'd suggest to continue third generation cephalosporin and metronidazole if there's a strep millery or peptostreptococcus or some kind of agrogexibacter species, I, I'd continue with a third, third generation cephalosporin and metronidazole. Whereas if it's Staph aureus, it's often, almost often, almost always monomicrobial. The same applies for Pseudomonas. And I guess you see these brain abscess patients maybe a little more, more frequent than I do. Uh, and also for the Listerian and the Nocardia, they're rarely uh, polymicrobial. So um, keep that in mind. So there are some diagnostic clues. If the underlying condition of the patient, if you know they have right to left shunting, e either due to congenital cyanotic uh, heart disease or pulmonary arterial venous malformation, oral cavity bacteria are often involved. And the same applies for a pulmonary focus, but you should also keep aspergillosis and nocardiosis in mind. For cholesteatoma, it's also frequently upper airway bacteria and also pseudomonas. For migrants in my setting, you should still consider the usual pathogens, that's oral cavity bacteria, but also tuberculosis, parasites, and fungi. For head trauma, you know this, it's Staphylococcus aureus gram negatives and pseudomonas and skin colonizers. And for the immunocompromised, nocardiosis, fungi, toxo, and listeria. Great, so for treatment, it's really a, a combination of neurosurgery to establish the diagnosis, identify the pathogen and the susceptibility patterns. That's very important because we treat patients for six or eight weeks and toxicity issues often uh, occur. And then we need to know which kind of alternative drugs can we use? So for that reason, it's very important to get this um, sample, this clinical sample, but also for source control. I really must stress this. I think sometimes uh, um, I, I, we need to discuss this, at least in, in my setting. They're very nice, our new surgeries, uh, surgeons, and they're very skillful, but sometimes we discuss this need for source control or not. So in my opinion, that's quite important in order to cure these patients. And then there's also the, the added benefit of reducing symptoms and decreasing risks of impending herniation or rupture. But that's really a, a tertiary goal where I think source control and establishing the diagnosis is, are the main objectives. The anti-effective therapy, I discussed that a little bit previously. And then there's the adjunctive treatment. We'll get into that uh, on a later slide. So at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that this was mainly a neurosurgical uh, infection and disease. And I, was, uh, and I still am very honored to give this talk. And the first uh, successful report of treatment of brain abscess was by this French sur surgeon, S.F. Morand, in 1752. And he claimed to have cured a patient with an autogenic brain abscess. And I'm just so impressed with these historic cases because they use their clinical judgment to diagnose the brain abscess. And then without anesthetic at that time, they drilled that hole, hole into the brain and just um, uh, tap the brain abscess using sometimes decalcified chicken bones or some silver tube or something like that. And uh, that's just so impressive to me and also highlights the importance of neurosurgery nowadays, I think. This guy, Sir William McEwen, is also very famous. He did a 
case series of, I think it was 21 or 23 patients that he published in 1893. He was a Scottish neurosurgeon and he looks very serious with a big mustache and he was very, very highly respected. And uh, he cured all those patients also using his clinical uh, judgment to diagnose the patients and draining the brain abscess. But there's also this very famous Turkish neurosurgeon that I came across, Dr. Kemil or Simil Tupuslu or Simil Pasha. It was a, I, th I think it's a, a loving nickname for him. And in 1891, he actually cured a brain abscess in the Ottoman Empire. It was a patient who had, uh, had a brain trauma or head trauma and he had uh, a fragment of bone lodged into his brain. He had uh, seizures. So first he removed the bone and uh, unfortunately there was a secondary infection with an abscess and then he drained the abscess and the patient was cured. So he reported this at, at an international congress in Lyon in 1893. But you can look it up in that paper in the bottom right. It's quite a nice little a description of him. So I think he looks like a gentleman a scholar. Okay, so just stating uh, the principle uh, here by McEwen, one might almost conclude that in uncomplicated abscesses of the brain operated on at a fairly early period, recovery ought to be the rule. So this is something that you neurosurgeons have practiced for a long time. And I think something that we should keep on doing. But when to do neurosurgery or not. So here, it's really not that simple always. It's, it, patients may be in the beginning of life or at the end of life. So that's always something to be balanced. Comorbidities, uh, hemorrhagic di diathesis and coagulopathies and so on. And also the location of the brain abscess. But as a rule of thumb and in general, uh, some authors state that uh, brain abscesses above two centimeters in diameter should be treated surgically. And I agree to that. I think we should always try to get the diagnosis confirmed, the susceptibility patterns, and also reduce the inoculum, just because you never know what's going to happen in a week or two later. But of course, I understand that it's not always feasible. It's just uh, in the perfect world, that would be uh, the ideal. So in this study, going back to the Danish registries, I examined patients, the 1,384 patients who were treated conservatively, that is no uh, abscess or no aspiration. Uh, that is this line. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's that uh, line that is kind of looking kind of crude because there are a few observations here. You can always see 80, uh, 45 patients. So, sorry, uh, that was the excision uh, graph, apologies. So only 45 patients were treated with excision uh, during that time period in Denmark. And here you have the conservatively treated patients. And here you have the mortality on the y-axis. And then you see the aspirated patients here. So there's an old Latin saying, o ubi pus ibi evacua, which means when there's pus, it should be evacuated. It certainly is true for abscesses in other parts of the body. It's also, I think it's true for brain abscesses but of course, there may be exceptions. And please keep in mind that these are observational data. These patients were not randomized. So there is bound to be confounding by indication. For instance, patients treated conservatively could be very well patients who are not sick, who have very small brain abscesses and who are going to be cured no matter what if we just give them antibiotics. And then severely ill patients where you defer to be, or where you prefer not to do a neurosurgical procedure. So it, the point here is there's just no apparent advantage to conservative treatment. It may be right in some patients, but there's not a survival benefit in not uh, proceeding with neurosurgery. So I think that's important. We should do aspiration or excision when, it's, when it appears to be feasible and reasonable. So for the antimicrobials, uh, there are a lot of challenges. I think there's challenges to the neurosurgery. I really admire that you can do surgery in something as delicate as people's brains. And for the antibiotics, it's also kind of difficult because we have the blood brain barrier and we have the abscess capsule and we have the bacteria lying within this fort uh, uh, and quite inaccessible to the antibiotics which can penetrate into the brain abscess core. Uh, 
which is why we often need your help. So we need a drug that is active within the acidic environment of the brain abscess. It penetrates the brain, blood-brain barrier at the capsule. It has adequate physiochemical properties which help it to penetrate into the abscess. So lipophilicity and small size often help uh, with that. And it should have a limited risk of developing mm -hmm. bacterial resistance or toxicity. And uh, if uh, available, there should be an uh, oral formulation available at, for the end of treatment. So unfortunately, there are very limited data on the antibiotic treatment of these patients. There are very few rat models on the treatment, and there are a few clinical samples which are really just taking ad hoc. Uh, and most of them date back to the 1970s or 80s of just one or two patients. And apologies. <coughs> a maximum of 32 patients. And there were no late samples. Of course, patients are not having their brain abscess aspirated just for some scientific question three weeks into treatment to check out what is the antibiotic concentration after three weeks of treatment. There could be some accumulation in, in the abscess, but we don't have any data on that. So it really boils down to it's, it's, it's heterogeneous study populations with a non-standardized treatment and there are no control groups. So it's difficult to, to know which drugs to use. And still we have clinical experience since the fifties and it started out with penicillin and chloramphenicol and, and then metronidazole was added in the 70s. And since the, the 80s, I think most places use kefotaxime or keftriaxone combined with mitronidazole. And then you can consider vancomycin. I think MRSA is, is quite uh, prevalent in Turkey. And you may correct me if I'm wrong. So you can consider adding that. For the HIV positive patient, you want to cover toxoplasmosis. And for transplant recipients, you may want to make sure that you add a boracanosol or and also back trim to cover both listeria and fungi and uh, no cardiosis. Okay, just a little more on the antibiotics. I'm an ID specialist, so I, I know that you're neurosurgeons, but this has my uh, high interest, I guess. So for beta lactams, time above MIC is very important. So we want to have the bacteria continuously exposed to the antibiotic. Uh, so for kefotaxime, that's better documented than it is for keftriaxone. Keftriaxone is dosed once a day, so it doesn't really fit with the time of above MIC. It's highly protein bound. Still it works, I admit it. There are no data showing that it's not as efficient as kefotaxime, but kefotaxime has just better documentation in general, also with intercavitary uh, measurements in 15 patients. And it also has an active metabolite within the brain abscess, which works uh, similarly as a second, second generation uh, kephalosporin. Okay. For meropenem, uh, really there's no particular advantage in the studies that are available nowadays. It could be the right treatment if the patient has ESBL or uh, some other high risk factor like trauma or post-surgical patients or pseudomonas in a cholesteatoma, then uh, you should go with meropenem and maybe add uh, vancomycin. Uh, but uh, in general, just for the usual com community acquired brain abscess, there's no particular advantage. So the duration of treatment, I think an anexized brain abscess it should be four weeks or longer. Aspirated brain abscess, six to eight weeks. And you can consider prolonging treatment if it's very large or if there's been a rupture, I think you can agree with me. Patients who have had a rupture, they often have very complicated hospital stays. They're admitted for three months and need the external ventricular drainage and it's just back and forth. And then finally they start to improve, but they, they never seem to get really completely well, uh, uh, at least very rarely, I think. So for the oral consolidation therapy after a full course of IV antibiotics, there's no evidence of benefit. We don't use it in my setting, except for nocardiosis and toxoplasmosis and tuberculosis, of course. But for other pathogens, it's, it's just not clear. If you had six to eight weeks of IV antibiotics, there's no need of oral consolidation therapy. And then sometimes there may be early transition to oral antibiotics 
and that is what we're doing a clinical trial on right now but um, we're still recruiting so no data to share with you yet we did this survey on antibiotic treatment among id specialists in five countries denmark sweden norway no sorry denmark sweden france and australia four countries apologies just to see what were people's uh, in uh, perception of how do we treat these patients and you can tell here on the far on the right hand side that for excised brain abscess i think most uh, physicians prefer four weeks some do two weeks uh, others do six weeks and for the aspirate for the conservatively treated patients here with the light blue bars you can see most uh, uh, uh, id specialists tend to prolong treatment to six to eight weeks and for the aspirated brain abscesses it's about four or six weeks okay so the complications and outcome i think uh, what i fear the most in these patients is rupture uh, because it uh, has a high uh, mortality and patients just really have a very complicated hospital stay and often have a uh, uh, sequelae afterwards. Uh, neurological deficits, it really depends on the abscess location. There may be a risk of herniation. I think it's, it's somewhat rare, at least in my setting. Hydrocephalus occurs in ruptured brain abscesses. So it's about 5% that uh, have a permanent a ventricular peritoneal shunt in, in my setting. And then epilepsy in about one out of three. Uh, mortality uh, is about 7%, uh, 30 day mortality, the 90 day mortality, which sort of corresponds to end of treatment after the six to eight weeks, is about 15%. And then uh, mortality in about one year is, is 20%. So it, it continues to increase in these patients. Uh, I'll get more into that uh, in uh, one of the next slides. So for rupture, uh, there really are a few data to examine this. You can see I collected some of the studies that I thought were, were best. And you can see here the estimates on the far right hand side, they vary from in these studies from four to 35%. Uh, but the uh, sample size is quite limited except for the South African study. But if you remember the South African study, they really had a lot of uh, trauma patients and a lot of HIV patients. So at least for me, it's difficult to generalize to my setting. So some uh, suggest that capsule formation may be less stable in areas with reduced blood supply. So that's often close to the ventricular side of deep-seated brain abscesses and dexamethasone may weaken the capsule. So uh, these have been uh, suggested uh, mechanisms for brain abscess rupture. Uh, when looking in, in adjusted analysis, uh, these risk factors have been shown to be uh, uh, associated with an increased risk of rupture that is localized enhancement on the capsule closest to the ven ventricles if the capsule is very close to the ventricles or if it's multiloculated. And uh, well, I guess in some of these studies, the case fatality was even higher than what I've shown over here. So in Denmark, these are unpublished data. We're planning on submitting them uh, later on this year. You can see we compare patients with an intraventricular rupture of brain abscess, that's iroba. We have 65 patients and compare them with non-iroba. And what comes into mind is, well, they have full-blown meningitis, a lot of these patients. Of course, they're, they're often neck, uh, stiffness. Uh, the CSF leukocyte count is uh, severely increased. Uh, it's often oral cavity bacteria in, in our setting, but you can see oral cavity bacteria are generally frequent as the causative pathogen in Denmark. Uh, and then there's a, a need for external ventricular drainage and they really have a poor outcome. Only about 14% of them survive with uh, little or no sequelae. Okay, so these are studies looking at uh, case fatality. I apologize for the very busy slide. On the very top, you can see the famous meta-analysis by Matthias Brouwer from 2014. He had uh, 9,700 patients. And he observed during the study period from 1935 to 2012 that the mortality, the case fatality rate dropped from 40 to 
And then I collected all the population-based cohort studies. That is studies where you make sure that you include all patients in your area, uh, not just patients admitted at one hospital or at some department. So uh, you could see the case fatality rate varies uh, quite significantly in those studies. And few of them uh, include a standardized mortality rate like 30 day or 90 day or one year, which is more specific, I think, than a case fatality rate, which really depends on how long do you, how long are patients admitted, when are they discharged and how long follow up do you have on them. Then just to include uh, cohort studies from resource limited settings like Nepal or uh, Pakistan, and you can see mortality differs somewhat, but it's not that far from the more privileged uh, settings in modern times. Uh, so I guess neurosurgery is important and antibiotics. So this is the mortality. I just wanted to show you the long-term mortality of these patients. So here we have cases here with the blue line. Uh, of course, the mortality within the first year, as you can see here, is a 30-year follow-up. The first year mortality is very, very high, but the mortality continues to increase or, or, or differ from control populations and also patients hospitalized for appendicitis just to get another control population of patients admitted with a very severe infection. So if we only used one year survivors, I didn't show you, you that figure, but if we start follow-up time here and only include one year survivors, the two lines would still continue to differ. So there is an increased mortality in brain abscess patients for the long term, and it's it's not the brain abscess. Of course, it's cured, it's healed. It, it, it can't be the brain abscess after that long time. But I think it's a proxy for poor health in these patients. So we should do a better job at um, diagnosing comorbidities and making sure that they adhere to a healthy lifestyle and so on in the years to follow. We also just published a study in neurology, actually, it's out online now where we show there's an increased risk of cancer in brain abscess patients in the years, in up to 10 years after hospital admission. So something to keep in mind if there's a patient who is, is struggling with their health, maybe you should do a, a routine diagnostic workup for that. Okay, just to show you that mortality has improved using the uh, time period of 1982 to 1988 in Denmark as reference. You can see here that the 30-day mortality uh, rate ratios decreased. So the rate ratio is about 0.31. So a significant improvement in 30-day, in 90-day, and one-year mortality, even though it still remains quite high, the one-year mortality in about 20%. And risk factors for one-year mortality is, of course, age, no surprise, uh, whereas uh, immunocompromise is also associated with increased risk of mortality. Dental infection is actually kind of protective patients with a dental infection uh, as they, or uh, oral cavity bacteria as a causative pathogen tend to have an increased survival compared with the other ones, which also include the immunocompromised patients with fungi and toxo and cardiosis. So I think that makes sense. And then no surprise, increased uh, uh, uh, comorbidity burden also is also associated with an increased risk of death. So uh, I don't have that many more slides, so bear with me, but just looking at the risk of epilepsy, previous studies have uh, uh, differed quite significantly from 3% to 72% here, but they're also quite old. This study is from 1973, the other one's from 1997, and again with a limited sample size. So I took advantage of the Danish registries again and followed these 1,384 brain abscess patients with their matched population controls. And at this study, in this part of the study, we only looked at 30 day survivors. So everybody who's died within the first 30 days and their corresponding population controls, we omit them from the, we exclude them from the analysis. So we start day, day zero, it's really day 30, okay? And then we look at risk of epilepsy. And you can see here, it's just a massive increase especially during the first years after brain abscess, the risk of uh, being assigned a diagnosis code of epilepsy is, is very high among cases compared with population controls. So during uh, their lifetime, the risk is about uh, one out of three, I think. Now, could this be something 
Could this be a family related issue? Could it be some kind of genetic risk or uh, environmental risk posing these patients at increased risk of both brain abscess and also epilepsy? So it's not really the brain abscess, but it's the underlying confounder. For that, we used siblings of brain abscess patients and siblings of population controls and compared risk of epilepsy in siblings of the brain abscess patients. So that would kind of account for any genetic factors or something that they were exposed to during childhood. And you can see there's a slight increased risk of uh, epilepsy in siblings of cases, but not really near enough to explain that huge difference that we observed in cases versus population controls. So I thought that was kind of fun a uh, way to look at it. Now, what about the neurosurgery? Because brain abscess treatment consists of neurosurgery and also the antibiotics. Could we get a sense of did the neurosurgical procedure contribute to the increased risk of epilepsy? Well, these observational data, I don't think that they can be used for that kind of conclusion really, but I would like to show you the data anyway, but please just be kind of skeptic towards, I don't think that you are really the main reason for these patients to have epilepsy. There's an increased risk in patients who are uh, aspirated. Uh, this could be due to the procedure, as I told you, but I'm not really convinced about that. It's most likely that they have a brain abscess and it's uh, big enough to be aspirated. So if there's a big abscess, I presume that the risk of epilepsy is also increased. Uh, whereas you can see the risk is uh, somewhat lower in the other two categories for obvious reasons. So monitoring, this is uh, controversial in my setting because there are so few data on uh, what is the normal natural course of brain abscess. So after we treat them with aspiration, what or conservatively, how how fast should they improve on their uh, neuroimaging? Because as you know, there's a radiological uh, lack. Uh, there may be some residual uh, enhancement of contrast. So sometimes we get confused about that. So these are the studies that I've been able to identify on the topic. Uh, very few observations in each study, except for perhaps from the one by Mapala in 1988. And there they had uh, 15 patients who were treated conservatively and they observed a significant decrease at a mean of two weeks, but uh, with a standard um, deviation of 1.4 weeks. And it really often takes up to six months before the residual contrast enhancement is, is, is completely gone. And I think most would agree that if you don't, if you see deterioration in a, after two or four weeks, you should be concerned. No improvement after two weeks, you should keep calm. But if there's no improvement after four weeks, that would make me kind of think, are we on the right track here? But really the data are poor and we need better and more standardized uh, treatment. Oh, I'd like also just to emphasize the study here by Janssen in 2004. They also had a nice sample size and they had a, for the patients on which they had data, the 38 patients, 76 had a significant response after three weeks. So if you're not seeing a significant response after two or three weeks, you should start considering doing re-aspiration. And this is the study by Shirlene that I just addressed here. They're just showing it in a different way. But you can see there's a, quite a large variation as to when the brain abscess volume decreases. This is five weeks, so. Okay, I'll just move on on the sake of time. And uh, this group from, it's a group of neurosurgeons from uh, San Francisco that really state, that I think the same statement here, any lesion that enlarged after two weeks or failed to shrink after three or four weeks should be treated. And I, I, I guess I agree with that statement. Okay, so for the adjunctive treatments, dexamethasone is used for severely ill patients. So we use it if there's significant edema. There's no data saying that it's harmful. There's also no data saying that it's uh, beneficial, but I think we can all observe that when there's significant um, brain edema and patients are having pending herniation, it, 
it's often helpful, I think, just based on my personal view and interpretation of the clinical course of some patients that have treated. And anti antiepileptics, if the patients have had seizures, I think you should treat with it, but not as a primary prophylaxis. Hyperbaric oxygen treatment for the anaerobic brain abscesses is not recommended. I think there are some reports, but the data are not convincing yet. Then uh, some centers use contiguous, continuous irrigation and drainage. And it certainly makes sense to treat abscesses in this way. This is how we treat them in other parts of the body. But then there's also the dilemma of having a foreign object placed in the brain. So we don't use it in our setting. There have been some studies that shown a nice experience with it. Uh, there's still a lack of proper control groups, I think, but it, it may be something in the future uh, if we can get some some perhaps antibiotic coated drains or something like that would be nice but uh, for now it's it's not standard treatment and these are just some of my suggestions of what we need we need uh, pharmacokinetic studies and comparative studies of treatment we need uh, more studies on risk factors and we also need rcts you always need rcts but uh, um, the condition is very rare, so it's difficult in this um, in this infection. So uh, just to summarize, I think uh, brain abscess has an increasing incidence. The presentation is often unspecific or very dramatic when the brain abscess is ruptured. There are numerous predisposing conditions conditions that need to be addressed. Uh, you should con uh, remember that it's often polymicrobial and source control uh, with uh, neurosurgery and antimicrobials. Uh, are of course cornerstones of treatment. I'm just so curious about your Turkish experiences with this severe and complicated infection. So thank you for your attention and apologize for the long talk. I hope you are still awake out there. Uh, Jacob, please don't stop your screen sharing. Right. And I want to thank you for mentioning Jamil Pasha. And can you come back, come back to Jamil Pasha's slide, please? <laughs> So I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Suchi, I'm, I'm, oh, it was a good girl, I was unsure, but, but I'm, I can't really account for it in details. I just briefly read that, uh, that short story, but as I understand, he was a very famous Turkish neurosurgeon yeah, uh, who traveled the world and you know, he, shared his experience. He is widely regarded as the first neurosurgeon of Turkey or uh, rather first surgeon doing neurosurgical operations, procedures. And I called Professor Said Nadari. Uh, he is kind of expert about Jamil Pasha. Maybe he wants to talk one or two sentences about him. That would be awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. Professor Nadari. Hi. Uh, uh, this is Dr. Said Nadari. Actually, yes, uh, we published um, this first case actually. It was a case uh, with epileptic uh, seizures. And uh, I, I, I, he, was, he operated this case uh, in 1894, a couple, uh, three or four years after the first case published by Sir Victor Horsley. Uh, this is very uh, earlier. Uh, he performed uh, terephination and drainage of the cerebral abscess, and the case uh, improved totally. Uh, it is very early case in during the Ottoman Empire. Cemil Pasha was uh, found uh, actually uh, is accepted as father of surgery in Turkey. He was a general surgeon. You know, at that time there was not so much uh, neurosurgeons. Uh, he uh, also performed first. Uh, laminectomy in pot abscess at the same uh, days. Uh, uh, Professor, <coughs> I also add, uh, want to add, uh, Pasha means general. Uh, you said, Jacob. Uh, Pasha means... actually means uh, he was a military surgeon. Actually, Pasha was uh, general, actually, in the uh, military, actually. That means uh, colonel or general, something like that. Uh, but he was very famous, uh, first uh, modern surgeon. And then uh, in 1909, uh, 
uh, he became first a dean of uh, Darülfünun University in Istanbul. Uh, that's all, but this is very uh, good um, history. Uh, uh, if uh, Kamil uh, uh, permits, I want to ask one question also uh, to you. Uh, the question is, uh, um, I, I used hyperbaric oxygen in uh, spinal infections and epidural abscesses uh, in um, more than 30 cases. Uh, when we started to use uh, hyperbaric uh, oxi oxygen, uh, there was no, uh, almost no literature, well, maybe two or three case reports, but we started to use, and uh, at the beginning, we used the uh, hyperbaric oxygen in cases uh, with uh, wild infection in the spine. Uh, I mean, uh, even after three or four weeks or six weeks uh, of antibiotic therapy, there was no improvement, no reduction in sedimentation rate and uh, something like that. Uh, but with the time, uh, as we get good results, we started to use in almost all cases uh, because it shortens the use of antibiotic therapy. And uh, we had very good results. Uh, may, maybe in future, uh, we can use in uh, brain abscess, but uh, what is actually your uh, opinion? So, I, what's the question for me, Dr. Yeah, yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. So, that was very nice. For, thank you for sharing both your knowledge on, on the, the um, on the famous surgeon and also with your experience on the hyperbaric oxygen treatment. I, I completely agree that it's, it, if it turns out that we have more and more data showing that it's helpful, it's, it's, it could be a very nice addition to treatment uh, on several accounts because, uh, well, there are antimicrobial resistance is of course a problem. So we're all interested in reducing antibiotic usage. So that makes sense. And also it has a uh, effect on anaerobic uh, bacteria, but it also induces the immune system. So it's also these kind of non-specific uh, add-ons to uh, stimulating immune defense to uh, treating the brain abscess. Um, but I think, uh, and I think it's nice with the spinal abscesses and I think you should uh, continue, maybe collect more data and make sure that patients who were not treated by hyperbaric uh, um, therapy that your control group is is as similar as you can get it because also you improve likely your treatment with time and you become more focused you really dig into the literature in these patients uh, so there is a risk i'm not saying that it happened but there is a risk always that you can that when you compare the two it's it's two historic populations right so they're not similar so if you can get similar patients maybe from another center that treat them similarly as yours that would be an added advantage if you have improved results. Uh, we had a Swedish uh, professor at a, another university hospital here in Denmark treat a patient who had a brain abscess due to a very complicated eye infection. And, they, and he brought the principle of hyperbaric treatment to this patient. And in that case, so this is just a case report. It's not something that you can establish scientific pra or, or your everyday practice on, but in that case, it was not good because he had a very large air-filled hole in his brain that kept on expanding with the hyperbaric oxygen because there was a connection here through the eye due to that very severe eye infection. So in that case, it was just not a very good idea. But I think there may be some cases where it's, where it's uh, advantageous. Um, I guess time will tell. There have been some publications on it in brain abscess. Uh, from Sweden and I think somewhere in Central Europe, I just forgot it by now, but, but you can look it up. There, there are some experience or there is some experience with it. Uh, but I'd stick with the old virtue still of neurosurgery and antibiotics, of course. Did you have an add-on question or a comment? No, no, thank you. Oh, oh, okay. okay fine. Thank you so much, uh, Jacob. And now we can, you can uh, stop your screen sharing so we can see each other bigger. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, thank you, sir, for this very useful conference. And uh, we will ask the questions. And uh, let me ask my question. Uh, is there any advice from you to the surgeons uh, to increase the success uh, for isolating the responsible microorganism, especially for open craniotomies? So for the neurosurgical techniques, I'm really not the right person to, to, to no. answer this. He asked about uh, getting the spaceman. Yeah, so so I have I have some I have some suggestions. So depending on your setting, I think and okay, first of all, patient related factors. So if the patient is stable, you diagnose the brain abscess. I don't know how it is in your setting, but if the patient is clinically stable and it doesn't look like it's about to rupture into the ventricles, I would with, withhold antibiotics if you can get to do neurosurgery within one or two days, 24 or 48 hours that would increase the, the chance of identifying the pathogen. Uh, you can do blood cultures, but as I told you, it, it's quite, I think 28% positivity rate is quite low and it's really mostly for the very severe, or the very sick patients who have positive blood culture. So I think that was patient related factors. Uh, just for the microbiology related factors, um, you should have an experienced lab and you should bring the, the, the samples uh, very fast to the lab in order for them to uh, put them on the agar plates and make sure that they uh, grow them for uh, anaerobic bacteria. And also if they have available uh, PCR-based technologies or molecular technologies, they ought to be very good at uh, diagnosing some of the pathogens involved. The downside is you don't get the susceptibility patterns, so you're still kind of stuck in that direction. If if you had if you experience toxicity toxicity issues four weeks along the way uh, during treatment, um, and uh, yep, so so I guess we we are quite successful. I think uh, the seventy seven percent positivity rate. But it really just depends. Sometimes patients are just so ill, you you, you have to start treatment, of course, and maybe uh, neurosurgery is, is deferred for too long time to, to detect the pathogen. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Ertan Sevin and uh, Dr. Ismail Akkol uh, has asked the same question. Thank you for your presentation. How many days should we use the antibiotics after surgery when the abscess is totally removed? What do you recommend? Hmm. So I, I when, recommend... Uh, pa Sorry. There is a knowledge that uh, if it's totally ex uh, removed, a three days uh, IV antibiotics is enough. There is so a I, knowledge. Okay, I, I, I'm unfamiliar with data showing that three days should be enough afterwards. I think uh, most e experts recommend four weeks. I, I also think that may be excessive, really, because the definition is that you completely removed the brain abscess, right? So there should be no more left. But uh, the surrounding tissue, you can't really tell. Sometimes there's been seeding of brain abscess and it's uh, cerebritis and it's on the move or it's on the rise. So I think that's why we've seen these secondary brain abscesses develop. And I think that's why most experts recommend uh, four weeks of treatment. It, this is most likely enough, I think. I mean, it, it's most likely maybe a little, you, maybe you could do with a little less, but in that kind of sense, I would say, why take the chance? Every time we do studies on infections, on reducing length of treatment, we're always successful because length of treatment is usually established in the 1940s or 50s when antibiotics were introduced and everybody was just happy that patients survived and, and rightly so, I mean, who, who can blame them? So we just give them large doses and for long treatment and then everybody's happy. And I completely agree, but then nowadays we're a bit concerned about these treatment durations. But so it's just to say, every time we shorten duration of treatment, we're successful. But statistics is always an aggregated number, and so there may be case variation. 
so to to summarize my very long answer and apologies for that i think i think three days is is is bold uh, i think it, you may be successful in some cases where you truly just excised all infected tissue but you can't really be certain that there has been no seeding in the surrounding area where a secondary brain abscess would develop a satellite abscess or a sister abscess so I, I would treat them for three or four weeks four weeks at least four weeks okay three or four weeks. yeah three or four three or four weeks okay thank you sir uh dr tuna demiral uh, dr bodilson Thank you for your nice presentation. Is there a brain abscess that only can be treated uh, with medical? Uh, Adam Erdal is a professor in uh, infectious disease. Maybe he wants to ask by himself. Uh, he is uh, from our hospital. Professor Demirdal, you can ask yourself. And you can turn on your microphone if you are available. Okay, maybe he is not available. And go on. I am repeating the question. Okay. Is there a brain abscess that can only be treated with medical treatments, such as abscesses smaller than two centimeters? And the second question. In which cases should uh, emergency surgical treatment be considered? Thank you for your answers. All right. Thank you for your question. So I think uh, U.S. neurosurgeons must also sometimes have said, oh, this patient shouldn't be aspirated. So we know that we are successful sometimes in conservative treatment. That is no neurosurgery. Uh, I think if you, the ideal setting would be that you knew the pathogen and the the the brain abscess what, had a thick wall and it was, uh, so it was kind of stable and it was quite small, uh, but I would still monitor it to make sure that uh, the patient really was cured. I, I, I just have some bad experience with the patients being conservatively treated, but I think maybe one in five or so uh, seems about right, one in six. There ought to be these, these kind of uncomplicated brain abscesses uh, that, that is able for or, or relevant for conservative treatment. And the second question, could, sorry, Gungu, I kind of lost track. There was two questions in that question. The second one Can you repeat, was, Gungu, second question? Uh, the question had two elements. Okay, okay. In which cases should uh, emergency surgical treatment right, be right. considered? Yeah. So, of course, in, in the ruptured brain abscess, I think that's pretty clear to everybody. Or if there's impending uh, rupture or herniation, uh, I think that should really, uh, you should prioritize uh, treating the patient. Also, but I don't, I don't really have data, that's strong data for that. We have some Danish data that we're about to publish. But if the brain abscess is larger than three centimeters, we find in our setting that there's an increased risk of death. That is, we have about 500 patients that we've gone through. So in the adjusted analysis, that was an independent risk factor. And it just makes sense to me also that the larger the abscess, the weaker the capsule will be. So it, it's more easily to rupture. So rupture is really my, my big concern. I may have a fixation on it. I, I admit that, but that is really my concern. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, but I don't, I don't have a criterion for age or gender or immunocompromise or not for the, sorry, just for the, for the speed of which to do the aspiration or excision. It's, it's more an anatomic or, or mechanistic approach I would use. Sorry. Thank thanks. you. Another question uh, from Dr. Yashar Bayri. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. What do you advise for the immunocompromised patient with fungus abscess after surgery? All right, very good point. So I, I completely agree with that very last part of the sentence because I think fungal brain abscess it has really been a death sentence uh, most of the time. I think it's it often still is 
there's been some experience uh, recently, a German paper, I think they were a bit too optimistic. Maybe they had a patient selection, but they had some patients survive. And, and I think some of those cases highlight aggressive neurosurgery of resection if it's aspergillosis, which is angioinvasive, tends to invade the blood vessels and cause uh, strokes. It's really, really severe. So in those cases, I would recommend uh, excision and, and uh, somewhat aggressive excision. So the, the, the person who asked the question also emphasized that after treatment. So I think there's been some data supporting that we should use boriconazole after surgery. It has better penetration than amphotericin B, even if it's liposomal. So, so for, uh, for aspergillosis, it would be uh, a boriconazole, whereas for the uh, candida infections, it's often the amphotericin B that is uh, recommended or fluconazole. But otherwise, okay. then that try to try to reverse the immunocompromise, the predisposing immunocompromise. But in a lot of these patients, it's it's not really a reversible immunocompromise. It may be a hematological malignancy, a stem cell transplant, a, an organ transplant, and you can kind of reduce the immunosuppression, but only to a certain degree. So I think that is very very key. But often it's just not uh, something that you can adjust. Thank you, sir. Dr. Özen Karasu from İzmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital. Mr. Badilsen, uh, thank you for this informative presentation. What's your favorite diagnose method? So, uh, I, I mean, in my setting, we have MRI readily available and com I, I, I prefer the cultures and then combine them with molecular diagnostics. The latter part is mostly just for my curiosity to make sure because it's still a rare disease and we need to learn as much as we can. And, and the, the patient courses during hospitalizations continue to be complicated. I think in first off, when you see them mostly, I just guess there's a lot of dramatic complications with herniation or seizures or uh, rupture and stuff like that and then when we see them it's less dramatic but it's still just tricky to treat them with the toxicity and maybe chronic diarrhea clostridial infections and so on so we want to change treatment uh, so for these reasons i think we should learn as much as we can when they're admitted and that's why i combine I, I prefer to combine molecular diagnostics with culture thank you sir Dr. Edwin Basi from Bulgaria. Thank you, sir, for the brilliant presentation. I think you have done excellent job. And his question is, when should we stop the antibiotic treatment in this condition? When there is no more radiologic abnormality on MRI? Or should we follow up the patient with CRP from laboratory also? Would you share with us who is doing and uh, following the antibiotic treatment of the patient uh, post-operative in your country, infectious disease specialist or neurosurgeon? Okay, so in, in my country, it is neuro, uh, not neurosurgeons, ID specialists who follow these patients. So once the neurosurgical stage is over, once the, the very acute stage is over they're transferred to our department and we complete the treatment and i think the question is really really good and th there's no clear answer because i don't think uh, that crp or biochemistry is is helpful in these patients it, it is really uh, just the overall clinical um, examination and a discussion with the patient how are you feeling have you had any uh, headache or uh, uh, deterioration of your neurological deficits or are they continuously improving i think using radiology is problematic because there will be changes for a prolonged period of time so if you prolong beyond six weeks you should really think am i doing this for the patient or am i doing this for the next mri scan uh, i think that is uh, that is key in these patients just talking to the patient and clinical examination uh, are my preferred uh, methods. If it's been a very, very large brain abscess, like five, six, seven, eight centimeters, it, it's, it's, I think it's logical that these patients will sometimes be treated for a longer period of time because the surface area compared to the volume 
is much less. So the antibiotic penetration is, is, is more complicated. So in order to make sure that you killed all the bacteria in the center of the brain abscess, sometimes you want to prolong the treatment, but we rarely go beyond six weeks in my setting. It's okay. mostly the pathogen. You know, it's difficult to treat pathogens that I mentioned before, like nocardiosis and, of course, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis. But we know this. We have to continue treatment for a long period of time. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Dr. Gigi, thank you, Dr. Jakob, sir. Very brilliant presentation, very helpful. And uh, Edwin Vasvi has another question. We know that radiologically, sometimes brain abscesses look like brain metastasis. Do you use any additional imaging to differentiate them? Would you share with us if you have some advice in this direction? So uh, I know there's been people looking into spectroscopy in, the, in HIV patients who have lymphoma or toxoplasmosis, but we don't use it. We go for the, we go for the direct sample, no more proxies. No more like blood tests or blood cultures or imaging. Then we need to get the clinical sample to get the diagnosis. So uh, we don't use PET CT. No, sorry, yeah, PET uh, brain of the uh, PET of the brain or a spectroscopy. We really just go for the clinical sample. So there may be some advantages to it, and uh, I know some of my neuroradiological uh, colleagues uh, can do a lot with the imaging, but uh, we prefer the clinical sample to get the, either the cancer diagnosis or the pathogen and susceptibility. Okay, sir. I think there is no more question. I thank you for those for this useful presentation and uh, your mentioning Cemil Topuzlu and Trabzonspor. Uh, <laughs> okay. Congratulations. We, we, we have spoken before the uh, conference began. And I give the microphone to Professor Hassan Kamil Suju. Okay, thank you so much, Jacob, for this uh, excellent presentation. I think it was useful for everyone who joined us today, tonight. And your speech uh, took uh, an hour, one hour. And the discussion part uh, took uh, 26 or, uh, minutes, almost half an hour. It was a good lecture. There was good uh, discussions. Thank you so much for accepting our offer to speak. It's been online neurosurgery. Maybe we can see each other in some future. And there is one more thanks from Figen Kaptanay Domuş. She's a uh, also infectious disease specialist and uh, associate professor in our hospital. She also thank to you. Thank you so much. And well, I, I, I have good memories from Ismi. I just wanted to say so to you. I had good memories from Ismi. I was there in 2013. 2013? Yeah. Ah, it changed a lot. You must come again. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Turkey I is a around. wonderful country. <laughs> Tur okay. Tur Turkey okay. is a wonderful country. So thank you for having me and a good day to everybody. Thank you there. so much. All right. Good evening. Bye bye. bye. bye.